Okay, so let's chat about light transduction, and we're going to start with the cells. Okay, so light transduction, conversion of light into a um, nerve impulse is carried out by two types of cells. I'm going to draw very primitively and um, we're going to have rods and cones. So first of all, why do we call them this? Conceptually, you can represent the rod this way. Okay? And the cone, you can show it this way. So you see the difference? This one is cone shaped, this one is rod shaped. Those are photoreceptor cells. And physiologically, they are modified neurons. Am I clear? It's really important to understand. Those are neurons which are highly specialized for working with light. Are we clear? Now, what are those zigzag lines? So within the photoreceptor cells, there are membrane folds, okay, that basically form uh, like structure that looks like stacked discs, okay. When you see folds, why? What's the purpose of folding a membrane? To increase what? Mm -hmm. It's all about surface area. So, these membranes are directly responsible for absorbing light. And the more surface area you have, the more efficient they are at absorbing light. Are we clear? Each of these cells, each photoreceptor cell, is embedded into pigmented cell. I'm going to draw it like this. Okay. It's not a depressed, like they, like they are embedded, so those are pigmented cells. So the role of the pigmented cells is to recycle the fragments of photoreceptor cells, which constantly come off, because photoreceptor cells, quite frankly, they experience kind of a lot of onslaught from, from the environment, you know, from the light and so on and so forth. Okay, we're good so far. Now, what's the difference between the rods and the cones? So, um, we're going to talk about, we're going to bring this term back in the future, but mm -hmm. basically you have in each of these cells, you have a special molecule. It's called visual pigment, okay? Visual pigment is responsible for light absorption. Visual pigment molecules are on these membranes like this. Okay, so those are visual pigment molecules just for the sake of illustration. So it turns out that rods have only one type of visual pigment. Okay, while cones have three types of visual pigment. which are blue, green, and red. It's not the color of a pigment. It's the color.
color of light that pigment can absorb. So this is why we can see colors. Because the areas of like bluishness and greenishness overlap. Areas of greenishness and reddishness overlap. So those spectra of the visual pigments, they overlap with each other. And this is we, why we can see different colors. Does that make sense? That little statement. There are people, those, that visual pigment is the product of a gene. Okay, we already talked about it and we mentioned melanin regarding the skin, right? Remember? So, some people have genes for maybe one, maybe two, maybe all three visual pigments defective. Are you with me? So, we call this condition how? We call it uh, color blindness or Daltonism, which is named after John Dalton. Uh, he was a British physicist and chemist who was like completely colorblind. So that's the only condition that you need to know the name of. It's called achromatopsia. Okay. It's a Greek word. Opsia refers to eye. Okay. Chroma refers to color. So colored vision and A means no. So no colored vision. Okay? Okay, all are gone. It's genetic. Uh, what there are a gazillion of them, like if they have some weird names like protonopia, duturanopia. I never remember which one's which. Uh, it can be lower levels, absence of them. So basically people may not be able to see blue or red or slightly lower ability to see green. And so that also is considered to be color blindness. Mostly affects men. Okay. As far so good? Okay. Now. What it means if we like forget about achromatopsia, one big difference between the cones and rods. Obviously, rods respond cannot; they do not have colored vision. So we're going to call it grayscale. Cones are responsible for colored vision. Okay, we're good. Now, another interesting difference between the two is that rods um, highly sensitive, which means vision in the dark. Cones are not so sensitive. which means vision in the bright light. Okay, we're good. But the trade-off, and we will talk about how this trade-off works. The trade-off for rods, for their ability to see in the dark, is that the image is grainy. low resolution. While well, with the cones, it's high resolution vision. Does that make sense? So, what, why I like to talk about special senses, among you know, many other things, especially for vision and hearing, it is so easy to just give examples from right now. So right now, you can see colors, you know, you can see color coding here, um, to some extent, color coding. You can see colors, it's high resolution, all that kind of stuff. That makes sense? Because 
which cells are engaged mostly? Your cones. Well, not most, actually, only that, right? Now, when you try to find a t-shirt at 4 a.m. in the morning without turning on the light, it is really hard, believe me, I tried. If you want a particular, because you cannot see colors. And you can barely see what's written on the t-shirt. This is your night vision, okay? Grainy and, and low resolution and, and not color. Very clear. Now, this brings us to one little topic that makes more sense to talk about here. Uh, we're kind of going back to the anatomy of an eye. So this inner surface here is retina, right? So it turns out on the retina, if you would, if you would take an uh, ophthalmoscope, that little thing that physician holds when they look into your pupil to look at the bottom of your eye. In the back of the retina, you can see yellow spot, which literally is called like a spot. Is called macula lutea, which literally means yellow spot. Okay, and in the center of a macula lutea is fovea centralis. Okay, what is so particular about that structure? In that spot called fovea centralis, you have only cones. We good so far? So, first of all, when you look at something, so for instance, if I tell you, look at this marker, and you look at this marker, the image of this marker is focused on the fovea centralis. Because it's the area with all the cones, the best vision, best colors, best resolution. Make sense? How big it is? If you prefer inches, it's one, you don't have to memorize the number, of course, approximately one fiftieth of an inch. So it's ridiculously small. Okay? That makes sense? When you start moving on away from Fovea Centralis, number of cones goes down number of rods goes up. So essentially your peripheral vision more as it becomes more and more peripheral it starts lacking both clarity and colors. Okay we're good about your peripheral vision so far. Okay. This comes heavy lifting. I mean, no worries, it's, you know, it's doable. So, trying to think what to start here with. Okay, let's, let's go back to, to the foundations and just recall what is nerve signal is. It's the change in the membrane potential, right? That's it. One way or another. So, first, I think what we're going to do, we're going to discuss how photoreceptor cells can change their membrane potential in response to light. Okay? We good? So, to address this issue, we're going to start with the whole idea of a visual pigment that I already mentioned here. So if you try to be a more granular visual pigment, it's called rhodopsin. So this visual pigment in, in itself consists of two parts, okay? So this blue part is the protein called opsin.
Now, this protein non-physically is bound to an organic molecule, and I'm going to draw it like this, if you don't mind. It does not reflect its shape by any means. I just want it to be something specific, like the angle looking up. So this is 11 cis retinol. Organic mold. We good? Now imagine that this visual pigment, this photopigment, is exposed is exposed to the light. Okay. Does light does light carry energy? Yes, it does. So the energy of light changes the shape, but not of the protein, but of 11 cis retinol. We appreciate that the chain that the shape changed. Okay, so this is now a so-called all trans retinol. Are you with me? So to kind of recap what we just saw, you have a complex between the protein and the organic molecule. And when organic molecule absorbs light, due to energy of light, it changes its conformation, changes its shape from 11 cis retinol to all trans retinol. So this change is the signal. Are we clear? Because we will need this knowledge farther down here. Good? So that's one. Two, when it changes its shape, it dissociates from opposite. I usually use this very, very simple demonstration. So imagine that my fist here, look, this is my fist, right? This is opposite. This marker is 11 cis retinol. This is how they look in the dark. When they expose to the light, 11 cis retinol becomes all trans and then separates from opposite. Make sense? Don't read too much into that. That's kind of that. That's all that happens. Big question, of course. Can it go back? It absolutely can. But since, in order to convert eleven cis into all trans, you had to apply energy. You need to break down ATP into ATP and then organic phosphate. Basically, you need to use the energy of ATP to bring it back to its original original form so it can sense the light again. Does that make sense? Now, let's address one sort of thing about difference between the rods and the cones. So, rods, first of all, these two processes, the process that is induced by the light and the process that follows, you know, breakdown of ATP, they kind of go back, back to back, simultaneously, right? But here's the thing. For right now, right at this moment, in your eyes and in my eyes, since rods are insanely sensitive, the process of reverting them back can't keep up with a conversion induced by light. So all your rods now, all of them, exist in this state. It's called bleached. They completely bleached. 
Does that make sense? They can't sense light. Because they're so sensitive. Your cones, on the other hand, yeah, they, they, they do sensing, and then they go back, and then they do sensing, and they go back, and, you know, you, you use energy to see, okay? Make sense? And, obviously, there is, there's a limit, like, if the light is too bright, your codes are going to be bleached out. I mean, like, super, super, I don't know how bright it should be. Okay? Good? Okay. Moving on. This is going to be a molecular story. It's, um, it's not really complicated. Just follow the steps. Just pay attention. So we're going to draw, basically, a gigantic membrane here. Okay. And this is going to be our, on, in the membrane, in the membrane, there's your opsin, right? Okay. And it contains 11 cis resin. Okay, when you expose your opsin with 11 cis resin also light. What happens to 11 cis resin? It converts to all trans, right? And as it converts to all trans, what does it do? It dissociates from opsin. It's a bit of a change, isn't it? So that change activates your old friend, let's put it this way, the G protein. Okay? And this activated G protein moves within the cell, activating yet another enzyme. Okay? Now remember, this is just a schematic. Okay, this enzyme here, the red one, is called PDE. And PDE stands for phosphodiesterase. Names fancy, I know, but the most important thing, what, it, what, it, what does it do? So there's a molecule in the cell that's called cyclic C. GMP. So what phosphodiesterase does, it takes cyclic GMP and converts it into simple, non-cyclic GMP. And that's all. Okay? What is the role of cyclic GMP, you ask? Well, um, there's a channel here that's open. Okay? Channel's open. What keeps it open? Turns out it is open because there is a molecule of cyclic GMP that keeps it open. So this is your, listen, this is your ligand gated channel that is kept open by its ligand, cyclic GMP. You with me so far? Since it's a channel, it's got to let some ions either in or out. So what are those ions? Those ions are sodium and calcium that are more abundant outside of the cell. Are you following me? So normally, when cyclic GMP is present, they would flow into the cell, positively charged ions. Good? When cyclic GMP is broken, what's going to happen to that channel? Uh-huh. When this channel is closed, can sodium and calcium get into the cell? They cannot. When you stop positively charged ions from flowing into the cell, What's going to happen to a membrane potential of that cell? 
when you don't have positive charges getting into the cell, the cell becomes more, huh? More positive. When negative, because positive charges do not come into the cell. Are you with me? Since they don't come into the cell, it becomes more negative, which means cell hyperpolarizes. We good? Okay. That makes sense. Now to wrap it up as sort of a single story, here's what happens. When your photoreceptor cell is in the dark, your opsin, your rhodopsin exists with 11 cis retinal, your G protein is not activated, phosphodiesterase is not activated, right? Levels of CGMP are high. This cation channel is open. And, you know, your cell's fine. Good? When photoreceptor cell gets exposed to the light, 11 cis retinal becomes all trans retinal. All trans retinal dissociates from opsin. This activates G protein. G protein activates phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase breaks down cyclic GMP, which closes the cation channel. Lack of positive charges going into the cell result, results in the depolarization of your photoreceptor cell. No, sorry, hyperpolarization of your photoreceptor cell. That makes sense? It's kind of weird if you think about it. Because we used to think that, you know, it's not hyper. Hyperpolarization is basically inhibition. How the heck we can go from inhibiting photoreceptor cell to a signal? Turns out, that in your neural layer, you have three cells, okay? You have a photoreceptor cell, a bipolar cell, they're all basically neurons. And you have ganglion cell. We're good so far? So what happens in the dark? In the dark, well, in the dark, these channels are open, right? I'm kind of skipping. So they open, and it turns out your photoreceptor cell actively releases neurotransmitter. Which is inhibitory. Uh, I'm going to ask you a dumb question. Inhibitory neurotransmitter. What does it do to bipolar cell? Inhibits. I told you it's going to be a dumb question. So if the cell is inhibited, it means it is hyperpolarized. Okay? If the cell is hyperpolarized, can it transmit the signal? If it's inhibited, I mean it can't. That's it. No signal. This is why it is dark. This is why you don't see anything. Does that make sense? Now, all of a sudden, you see the light. So what's going to happen? Your photoreceptor cell, because, you know, this sodium and calcium channels, they close, it suddenly becomes hyperpolarized. Okay? If it's inhibited, does it release neurotransmitter? Nope. Which means suddenly your bipolar cell, compared to its you know previous state, becomes depolarized. 
and starts releasing excitatory neurotransmitter. Okay, which conveys the signal onto the ganglion cell. Okay, I mean, very corny comparison is that, like, you know, this is a girlfriend, this is the boyfriend, this is the girlfriend's dad. So when, like, dad is kind of fully awake, yeah, good luck dating, but then dad falls asleep and they can go on a date. Make sense? Um, if you, so if we try to put it, like, all together, so light converts 11 cis retinal into ultrons, which dissociates from opsin, resulting in the activation of G-protein. Activation of G-protein results in activation of phosphodiesterase, which results in the breakdown of cyclic GMP, which results in the closure of sodium calcium channels, which results in hyperpolarization of uh, photoreceptor cell, which does not release neurotransmitter anymore, inhibitory neurotransmitter. That leads to excitation, activation of previously hyperpolarized bipolar cell, which starts releasing excitatory neurotransmitter that acts on a ganglion cell. Okay? This story benefits from brain dump during, exam, uh, during the exam so much. If you like lay it down, you can... Those questions, and I can give you a heads up, the questions that regard this process are heavy. I'm not saying they hard, they heavy, because each answer is a really long statement, and you have, will have to select like what, which of the following happens, and you have to select which happens. Does that make sense? And if you have this in front of you, you know, in a brain dump, yeah, you can figure it out, right? couple of things, um, it's just easier to like wrap up the whole thing. So, first, why cones produce sharp vision and rods don't? So each, imagine that's a cone. Each cone, this, this chain goes all the way to the brain. So each cone conveys the information to one bipolar cell which conveys the information to one ganglion cell. We clear? Basically what I'm saying is for sharp vision, the size of the pixel in your eye is the size of one cell, which is incredible. Are you with me? So you can have really, really sharp vision. When you switch to rods, what happens, you may have a hundred, literally a hundred of rods, all converging on one bipolar cell. So suddenly you have a pixel that's not one cell but hundred cells, hundred times larger. The larger the pixel, the less resolution you're gonna have. That part, does that make sense? Um, few words, I'm not gonna pay too much attention, I'm not gonna ask too much about the um, Jesus, uh, the, the neural, neural pathways to the brain. Basically, what I want you to appreciate is this. If, and it doesn't matter which, so you have two eyes and you have two hemispheres, okay? So you have one eye here and it sends information into both hemispheres and another eye that says, sends the information into both hemispheres okay that make sense so this part here is optic nerve this part here is optic tract so optic nerve has neurons coming out of one eye, an optic trap, has neurons coming out of both eyes. This crossover is optic chiasma. Why it's important clinically? If you 
kill the optic nerve, stroke, tumor, whatever. That makes sense? You kill the optic nerve, one eye becomes blind. Clear? Like it's it's a given. Now, when one eye becomes blind, what happens? You lose some of the field of vision, and you also lose depth perception. So depth perception, you have it because your fields of vision from two eyes overlap. Are you with me? Um, if you will try to experiment, like I'm going to close my left eye, what it means, I still know that um, day is, is in front of the table but behind the camera. Does that make sense? How I know that? Well, I've got to say my experience. I know how objects are positioned in the world, right? But if I will try to do, to play, play say, a sports with an eye patch, anything that is dealing with the precise perception of depth, like throwing a ball to someone, you know, or, you know, maybe shooting a moving target, stuff like that, I'd be awful at it. Make sense? Now, if there's a damage to the optic tract, let's say we get tumor. I gonna lose some of the visual field? Yep. I gonna keep depth perception. Yes. Because you still have signals going from both eyes overlapping in one hemisphere. Does that make sense? So probably yes, you, you're not gonna be next Tom Brady, but at least you're going to have better depth perception than the person who's one eye blind. Questions? Let's take a little break. I'm going to be uploading those things.